Hi, my name is Amber Shuttleworth. Yeah, my name is Andrew Talind. My name is Whitney Curtis. My name is Jordan Richter. Hi, my name is Braden Lesler. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Duncan Cree. So, yeah, my name is Lindsay. I'm Devin Ramaswamy. My name is Akshar Gudger. Uh, my name is Dr. Adam McKinnis. I'm Jaffar Sultan. Hi, I'm Sam Ansari. What inspires me most about engineering, I think, is engineers solve challenging problems and make a difference to people's lives. Big picture, I'm, I really like the idea of how can we help? I guess we're constantly just fixing problems. The love of building things and taking things apart to understand how they work. The creativity. More of applied sciences. For me, the most inspiring part about engineering is that there are a variety of paths that your career can take. And to create the future. First up. Let's meet some USASC engineers working in agriculture. Meet Samantha, a biomedical engineering student saving horses. Samantha and her team are engineering a harness designed to help in the recovery and rehabilitation of horses from limb injuries, which are often fatal. Meet Terry, a USASC engineer designing safe livestock transportation. Terry's work has created safer livestock transportation for livestock like pigs and cattle. He has engineered disinfecting systems, sensors to monitor the health of the animals, and more. Meet Catherine, a USASC engineer using egg waste to make cleaner water. Catherine engineered technologies using egg waste, such as canola straw, to clean common pharmaceutical pollutants from water. Next, meet Ben, a USASC engineer helping farmers and ranchers. Ben leverages his strength in engineering, manufacturing, and technological innovation as Raven Business's Director of Canada. Raven is a leader in precision agriculture. Now, let's meet our panelists and hear how they are working in engineering and agriculture. We're going to meet some current students in the College of Engineering. So I'm just wondering if each of you can introduce yourselves and tell me the major of engineering you're in and why you chose to study engineering. My name is Jordan Richter. I am in computer engineering. I chose to go into engineering because it was seemed just like a natural fit, all the problem solving and taking uh, essentially something that you need and coming up with a solution to fix it. Really what I like doing and what I found interesting and what I still find interesting in engineering is we're constantly just fixing problems coming up with things that we don't know is a problem and fixing them. Hi, my name is Braden Lessler, and I am doing a dual degree, computer, DSP, and comp sci. So my main reason for going into engineering was the love of building things and taking things apart to understand how they work. That's something that I did while I was growing up. If there was something that was broken, I wanted to know how it works. And kind of the project cycle just started going, and it just kept going. So. Now I'm learning more about how to do, how to build things and how to have better processes. And hopefully that's what I'll continue on to in the future. Hi, my name is Akshar Gudger. I'm also doing a dual degree. I'm doing computer engineering software stream and computer science. Uh, mainly I chose engineering because it wasn't really, you know, I didn't really have a choice. Like I wasn't uh, too sure as to what I wanted to do. So I just thought I'd give it a try. Initially wanted to go with civil engineering, but that didn't quite work out and decided to give computer engineering a try and it, it worked out for the better. Hi, I'm Devin Ramaswamy. I'm a computer engineering student as well. Um, I sort of got because I was interested in sort of, you know, more of applied sciences. And um, well, my brother was also in engineering and uh, I saw a lot of the work he was doing and it really interested me. So. I decided to join up and uh, I liked computer science and uh, physics. So I thought computer engineering would probably be the best fit. So um, maybe I'll go back to Jordan. So um, you guys are doing a capstone project that um, incorporates agriculture and computer engineering. So can you tell me a little bit about uh, the capstone project that you guys are working on? Yeah, for sure. So our capstone project is the distributed agriculture data collection system, so quite a mouthful. Uh, but essentially what it looks to do is collect uh, environmental data from many distributed nodes uh, across a large agriculture area, 
which allows you to more pinpoint what's going on in a field uh, versus your just average weather station data for one common location. So the, the challenges with something like this is that uh, you're trying to make it low cost because uh, putting hundreds of these out in the field, you can't necessarily do that if they cost $1,000 a piece. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's one thing to design a, uh, you know, an instrument, but then to make it affordable so that your average person can purchase it and use it is another challenge. So Brayden, uh, the next question I have is, what problem is your capstone group trying to um, solve by creating this? That's a good question. So our capstone group is essentially trying to solve inefficiencies. As, as the world grows, you need to produce more food. And traditional methods have worked great, but now you can introduce more technology to make things more efficient. So if you know one section of the field happens to be dry, you know you need to water that section of the field. It saves you time from watering the whole field or you, where you know that the soil is already good to go and you're set. It just makes things that much more efficient. And as we have like tractors that are now GPS controlled, we can start linking in to those systems to try and explain to the computers. Be like, okay, so this system will feed in certain chemicals or certain uh, nutrients. And you can start adding more and more sensors to say, okay, we need chemicals here, but not there. That's really cool. I think uh, the thing that I think that is the coolest with engineering is that the capstone projects that our students get to do are um, solving real world problems. It's not just um, dreaming up something, you actually build it, which is really cool. Uh, so Akshar, I have a question for you. Um, computer engineering and agriculture, I wouldn't say is the most um, typical connection. So what unique um, perspectives does um, being a computer engineer bring to the world of agriculture? Uh, I think the general field of computer engineering is one that can really complement other fields. And uh, one, of the, one of the main uh, fundamental skills that we acquire from this degree is problem solving, which is a universal skill that you can use for almost any field. And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the technological innovation that is required in the agriculture field can come from uh, you know, computer engineering technologies and problem solving because as the population grows, like Braden said, uh, the demand for agriculture is growing and we need to really start looking at how we can improve the yields and uh, incorporate technology better. I think computer engineering is, is a very good uh, complementary field for agriculture and it could help both fields prosper a lot more. Um, so my final question is for Devin. Um, what uh, tip or insight would you give to any student who's considering either studying um, a mixture of engineering and agriculture or for a student who wants to enter computer engineering? Um, I would probably say, uh, I think you'll probably hear a lot of engineering students uh, say this, it's a lot of time input. You get uh, out of the degree what you put into the, the, the degree. That's, yeah, that's definitely something I learned. Uh, my first few years, I definitely didn't put that much time or effort in. And I think it really reflected in uh, my understanding. And obviously that reflects in your marks, but the more effort you put in, definitely the, uh, um, the yeah, the more you get out of it. Uh, I might just add a little bit on to the end there of uh, interesting stuff for prospective engineering students, especially computer engineering. Because uh, we're starting to get into the age of big data. So it, it comes as a buzzword, but it really means like we have information on absolutely everything and people can't digest it. So getting into computer engineering and having designing networks of sensors and such, you're creating more of that data that can be used to essentially have computers learn from it and be able to do the things that humans can't even do because humans can't handle that much information but computers can. So if we can design computers to look at things like agriculture and uh, other sets of information, they can digest all that information and, and more digestible information that a human can understand versus all this pure uh, data from a sensor. Yeah, and I think that ties really well with your project and kind of sums up what you guys are trying to do by having a sensor that has tons of data into making it usable 
um, for a farmer or for a researcher to actually make decisions based on that information. So thank you so much for meeting with me. Um, and I hope that the insights you guys gave will help some prospective students. So have a great day and thank you. Hi, my name is Amber Shuttleworth and I grew up outside of Calgary and I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering. So my education at the University of Saskatchewan has really helped my career because the program at the U of S is not specific to one industry. So there's interaction from key members of many different industries. So you get a taste for different industries and then your degree ends up that you're not streamlined to just work in one industry. I really think that if I had not gone to the U of S, my career wouldn't have taken the path that it had taken because there's not a lot of engineering colleges in Canada that do have that agricultural focus. While the teachers and professors at the University of Saskatchewan often have their own research programs going on, as a student, you don't ever feel that you're second best to their research programs. The teachers and faculty at the College of Engineering all go above and beyond to give the students the knowledge and education that they need to succeed in their careers. So I became an engineer because I was always interested in how things were put together and discovering new inventions. So as you can see, I have a farming background and I grew up around machinery and becoming an engineer and going into agricultural engineering just seemed like the next logical step. My degree in engineering, it's taught me fundamentals of machine design and materials and how materials are processed and heat treated and how the materials and the machine design and the stress analysis and all the processes come together and how you can apply those to create a machine that'll work better for customers and help them to achieve their jobs better and more efficiently and at the end of the day it saves the farmers in fuel and inputs. Currently I'm working as a consultant for an agricultural company out of Saskatchewan and we're doing research and analysis and the project that I'm working on will affect how farmers manage their wetlands. Right out of university, I was actually really lucky to be able to work for a major ag manufacturer here in Canada and I was hired as a field test engineer so I got to travel across most of North America to see the machines in the field and to perform tests in the field and collect feedback and data from the machine's performance in the field and we took that data right back to the engineers in the office and we were able to give them feedback to create a better product for the customers. One thing that might surprise most people about being an engineer is the number of engineers that are actually in the field seeing how their projects and products are working and analyzing how their products are working so that they can improve the products in the future. Being an engineer is not just sitting at a desk at a computer. There's a huge hands-on field aspect to being an engineer. For me, the most inspiring part about engineering is that there are a variety of paths that your career can take. There's design and there's analysis, there's testing, and, and also some people end up working in sales or other areas. Um, but even within design, there's so many different processes and machines and parts of a machine that a person can work on that the career paths are extraordinarily open. And for me, that's the most exciting part about engineering. I would tell my past self that a degree in engineering is achievable and fulfilling. I know when I was first trying to apply for engineering, I was really scared of if it, I would be able to do it and everybody says that it's really hard and it's academic and those things are true but an engineering degree is possible and is achievable and the resources are there to help everybody succeed in the program. All right, so next on our panelists, I have Dr. Jafar Sultan with me today. So why did you become an engineer and what inspired you to um, enter this profession? That's a good question. When I think of my high schools, what I was thinking, I was more interested in doing stuff. Really, I had no idea what that meant or what discipline would be best fit. Uh, so I had an, I have an uncle, uh, he was, a few years older than me, he was a university student at the time, and he said, look, you know, go to engineering because that will open up a lot of options for you. And by that time, you will figure out what you want to do. Really, I wasn't sure what to do. I, I knew that I want to do a lot of things, but really, he was a good uh, advisor, I would say, 
and I found that that he was he was right because when I went to engineering, then I saw so many doors open, so many possibilities open, and it was just a matter of I liking this area or that area, moving around, you know, after my graduation. So I guess that leads me to my next question. Uh, I understand you do a lot of research that combines agriculture and engineering. Could you tell me a little bit about some of the um, research projects you've been working on? Uh, yes, really the kind of the skill that we get from engineering, I would say if I want to name one, is problem solving. When I joined the University of Saskatchewan, I realized that we have a strong agriculture industry here. So that is a strong you know, driving force behind economy, job, everything. And of course, a lot of my research and interests were on environmental issues as well. So really, I combined these two and uh, these two ideas. And then I was thinking, what are the opportunities? What are the gaps that I can contribute, I can fill? And we have one very interesting project that really came from my my kind of personal passion. I, I, I have a small you know, garden. I, I call it you know, applied arts because I like to plant cherry tomatoes. And of course, when winter comes, a lot of my cherry tomatoes are not ripe yet. So I pick them and put them in a box with a couple apples and bananas and everything. And I kind of ripen them artificially at home. Now, why this happens? I read a little bit about it. It is because of ethylene. You know, there is a gas ethylene C2H4 in high school chemistry. We have seen it. What happens is that the right, the ripe apple produces ethylene, and that helps ripen the unripe tomatoes. Now, I was talking to a colleague, uh, and he was interested in agriculture in different climates in the north, you know, when you don't have, you know, uh, warm weather, with, you know, land is limited and resources are different. So he had a very interesting idea that to put, to build greenhouses that you can put in uh, harsh climate conditions in, in the north, for example, and these greenhouses are supposed to be uh, automatic, minimum you know, involvement of human and minimum resources. So it was almost like a closed cycle of greenhouse. Now, what happens is that in that greenhouse conditions, your ripe plants are producing ethylene and then that ethylene can harm the unripe plants. It is like giving a baby a growth hormone. You know, growth hormone is not good for a baby. So you have to remove that ethylene from a greenhouse. That was the idea. So we came to the lab and thought, okay, what is the best way that with minimum energy, with minimum supervision, we can remove ethylene? And that was behind a project that we are doing. We, uh, we have a project going on. Actually, a PhD student is finishing her project on it. And the idea is to convert ethylene to CO2 that plants like at room temperature with minimum energy consumption. So in that way, you are taking a harmful chemical from the greenhouse, converting it to a useful chemical for plants, and that is with minimum energy, minimum involvement of people. So that was the idea. We are working on it to establish the idea, hopefully to patent it, to turn it into technology, it has its own you know, life cycle. So really, it's the same thing. We are just in the business of problem solving. Doesn't matter, it's agriculture, mining, greenhouse, or, you know, or COVID. So that is what we like, and that's what we kind of enjoy. And that's what really we give back to the community in terms of our research productivity for the people. So I guess my final question is, um, what unique, um, uh, what does chem chemical engineering contribute to agriculture and what kind of unique um, things do, does your discipline offer to the industry? 
Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Really, chemical engineering is very versatile uh, because we we deal with with chemical reactions. It's 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 not like chemistry that we go to a you know, lab and put on lab coats and make something in a test tube. Those are great things that our friends in chemistry departments do. We take their test tube you know, product and we convert this to thousands of tons of products, you know, plastics, you know, uh, fertilizers, you know, medication, all those things. So in that regard, uh, we, we have different branches of chemical engineering. We have biochemical engineering, you know, the people that use microbes and biological reactions to make, you know, environment cleaner, produce products and medication and things like that. So in a way, that flexibility of chemical engineering uh, helps a lot. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, and all the prospective students here today will maybe get to meet you in their chemical engineering course. So I really welcome this opportunity of talking to people that are considering engineering or chemical engineering. And oh, I hope that they can join us as students one day and as colleagues, you know, as they graduate. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate uh, the open door policy and all the great things that our faculty are doing for the college. Thank you. Now let's meet some USASC engineers who are working in environment and sustainability. First, meet Dina, a USASC engineer protecting the prairies from floods and droughts. Dina uses data and projections for freshwater extremes to identify freshwater sources and infrastructure that may be at risk. The results will both improve communities' decision making and make engineers' designs more resilient to floods and droughts. Meet Thomas a USASC engineer cleaning up old mine sites. Thomas works to mitigate an environmental issue from old mine sites and helps restore them back as a resource for trapping, hunting, and fishing. Meet Shauna, a USASC engineer protecting drinking water. Shauna is a CEO at the Centre for Affordable Water and Sanitation Technology. This is a Canadian charity and licensed engineering firm founded by another USASC engineer, David Manns. Shauna helps to address the global need for safe drinking water and sanitization by building local knowledge and skills on household solutions people can implement themselves. Now let's meet some panelists and hear their stories. So yeah, my name is Lindsay. I'm from Saskatoon, born and raised here. Um, and I am currently a environmental engineer or my training is in environmental engineering. And I currently work as a G, what I would consider a geo-environmental engineer um, in the mining sector. So um, I grew up in a family of teachers and I thought for lots of years I would be a teacher just because that's what everyone in my family did. Um, you know, I always loved working with kids and, you know, I was pretty decent at explaining things, but I also had a love of math and science and tended to gravitate towards that in school. Um, and just as school went on, became increasingly interested in that. And in grade six, we did a project on space. And I decided that I really wanted to become an astronaut. And so in my part of my project was to look about what it required to be an astronaut. So I learned that most astronauts are engineers. And so I decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to be an I'm going to be an engineer because that's my best chance of becoming an astronaut. Um, fortunately, a little bit more research into the statistics and that just wasn't going to happen. So, but <laughs> I stuck on that engineering train and, um, you know, did a few science camps and sci-fi camps with the university and college growing up and just really, really loved that. So when high school came around, I had a few really great teachers who just even furthered my love of chemistry and physics and I knew engineering was the right choice for me. So. I went into engineering not knowing a ton about it. You know, you hear about the big three, civil, mechanical, and electrical. And so I kind of thought originally I'd be a civil engineer doing bridges and, and buildings and whatnot, but um, realized I didn't really like structures all that much after <laughs> first year. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe chemical engineering. And then I realized chemical engineering really doesn't have a lot to do with chemistry. 
Um, but then I was introduced to environmental engineering in first year in, in a class called GE 101. And Enviro offered a lot of things that I was looking for. It offered the integration of chemistry and biology, um, you know, geology, big picture thinking, and a lot of opportunities to work in some really cool situations. So I chose environmental and really ended up enjoying my classes that I was taking. Um, so I decided I wanted some extra, some experience in the field. And so the college offers an internship program um, to which I applied and went through the process and ended up getting a 16 month internship with what was Potash Corp um, at the time, um, Nutrien now. So I worked with Nutrien for 16 months and just loved it. I loved the challenges that the mining sector presented um, and the implications and the ability to affect environmental, um, the ability to affect the environment and, and what was happening there. So um, that really solidified what I wanted to kind of do post-grad um, or post-graduation. Um, and I ended up taking my time to finish my degree. And by the time I finished, I um, actually didn't have a job lined up. There wasn't any jobs available in the potash sector. And so I kind of thought maybe mining wasn't gonna be an option for me, but um, I ended up finding a job uh, posting for a position with O'Kane, which is the company I'm with now. Um, and I didn't really know a lot about it. The position was for a modeling engineer. Um, I had little to no modeling experience, but um, I got selected for an interview and went in and told them, I said, I don't really know anything, but I'd be willing to learn. <laughs> um, and I ended up getting hired on with O'Kane. So um, even then I didn't, I didn't really know what O'Kane did. Um, I knew it was something in the mining sector, but I didn't realize the scope of, of what O'Kane did. So I um, currently now work as a, um, I'm with our modeling group. So I work with complex numerical models in a variety of different programs, looking at um, simulating different processes and um, understanding the governing mechanisms at different sites um, in order to address environmental problems. So um, related to closure planning and reclamation. So the really cool thing is that I now get to work um, at sites all over the world. Um, I work with sites in the Arctic, in Europe, um, South America, Australia, um, some of the biggest mines in the world. Um, I've gotten to go see um, lots of opportunities to travel, not only domestically here in Canada, but internationally. Um, and I get to do that all from Saskatoon, which is super cool, I think. Um, I didn't really know it was a possibility when I entered A, engineering, or B, environment, when I even finished my degree of environmental engineering. Um, and so I really love what I do. I, I work um, with mining companies to um, address reclamation and closure planning um, and we yeah get to work I guess with all sorts of different people and all sorts of different fields so it's pretty cool. Wow that is really cool I know um, when I was younger I really wanted a career that would allow me to travel um, and meet different people so that's really cool that engineering has brought that for you. Um, so I guess my final question is if you could go back in time and talk to your future self or your past self um, about engineering, what would you tell yourself? Ooh, well, um, you know, coming through school, there's a lot of things that I think I learned and, and looking back, it's easier to see, but it, it was tough. I'm not gonna lie. Like engineering, it's a tough college. Like every college has its challenges and, and engineering is, is no different. It's, it's a hard four years if you want to do it in four and even if you don't it's a hard however many years you're going to try it in like i did it in four and a half years plus a year of internship and it wasn't easy there were lots of times i was stressed and upset and there was more than a few tears shed and a few failed exams here and there and you know some not so great grades but you know what you you make it through and and if you just keep persevering and, and really put in some time, um, you, you can do it. It's, it's very easy, it's very possible to get through engineering and to succeed to get to the other side and, and be able to do something that you love. Um, you know, a big thing I found too was balance. Um, you can study so much for a test, but at some point you really do need to sleep. 
and you really need to get outside your house and go for a walk or see some friends and really learning how to balance school. School in life helps with balancing work and life in the future. And I think that's so important. And, and if anything, you know, this current situation in the pandemic has only solidified that in, in my mind that you need to be able to have a healthy balance between work and life. And that starts at school. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for uh, talking to the students today about your story in engineering. I think it was really inspiring. So I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day and thank you again. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Duncan Cree and I'm a faculty member from the Department of Mechanical Engineering here at the University of Saskatchewan, and I've been here for about six years. Uh, I was born and raised in Ganasdage, which is a small native reserve near Oka, Quebec. And why did I become an engineer? Well, actually, it wasn't my first choice. Originally, I wanted to be a car mechanic like my dad. However, a high school teacher had talked to me and urged me to go to college because I had good grades. Also, I have an uncle who is a medical doctor uh, who has given me a lot of advice over the years. And uh, one time he asked me, why would you want uh, to fasten bolts all your life when you can be the guy to tell people where to fasten the bolts? So after uh, high school, I decided to go to um, uh, college and I took up a trade, a trade which was called aircraft maintenance, maintenance, aircraft maintenance. Basically, it's just an airplane mechanic, okay? And after that, uh, I went to university to study mechanical engineering, uh, and I ended up getting all my three degrees, my bachelor, master's, and uh, PhD, which is the doctorate degree. For summer jobs, I worked at different aerospace companies uh, to obtain experience, work experience. Examples are Pratt & Whitney Canada, and here, you may not know of this company, but they assemble or put together uh, aircraft engines. Another company was called Bombardier Aerospace, where I helped repair the uh, CF-18s. So these are the Canadian fighters, military jets. And I found that that was my, the, I guess you could say the best summer job I ever had. So it just shows that with some guidance, hard work, determination, and obtaining opportunities when they arise, one can achieve their uh, dreams and goals. Uh, so I understand that um, you're, you started out in aircrafts and now you're doing research and work in environment and sustainability. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about how you started doing uh, this research and what your projects are? Actually, so after my uh, aircraft maintenance, so this is like uh, repairing aircrafts. So this was mechanical, right? So then I decided I like mechanical things. So I went into uh, mechanical engineering. Following that, I did my master's and then PhD, and that's where you start um, doing research. And I, I guess over time, I, I, I liked uh, um, composites, and th that brought me to um, working with sustainable materials. Okay, so right now my research focuses on sustainable materials, which means I use waste materials that would otherwise end up in landfills. So examples um, I use are waste eggshells. And this is, this is not just from uh, households and restaurants, but I mean it's egg waste eggshells from uh, large processing plants. So they have like dump trucks of waste eggshells uh, that are discarded uh, to landfills. So I wanted to find a new use for them. And what I do is I add them into polymers. Okay, I mix them into polymers or plastics. So I take these waste materials, mix them with plastics, and uh, the good part is the plastics are made from plants rather than fossil fuels, like oil. So the new materials I make are as strong and sturdy as those made from oil-based plastics. They're an alternative for single-use plastics, um, like beverage and food containers. So you may know like utensils, like forks and knives and spoons we receive from um, restaurant um, uh, takeout. Usually these end up in the garbage and, and then the landfill, right? So the plastics I, I make, they'll break down in the environment with, um, they'll break down in the environment over time without causing any pollution. 
So in the end, I believe we need new materials that reduce the impact on our environment. That is really cool. One of my favorite things about engineering is how interdisciplinary it is. Um, that if you study mechanical engineering, it can lead you into a path of airplanes or in creating plastics, which is really great that there's so many career opportunities. For sure. uh, so my final question is, um, for any Indigenous students who are considering engineering, um, why do you think you should become an engineer and why do you think the field of engineering needs more Indigenous um, students in it? For sure, like if we look at the statistics, um, less than 1% of uh, engineers in Canada are Indigenous. So we need to increase the, the number. So I, I would tell the, the youth that uh, young Indigenous students, uh, they need to realize that math and science is not a new field uh, of learning. So their ancestors have used science, although in a different way, to find technical solutions to their problems for thousands of years. So Indigenous peoples of Canada were very adaptable as can be displayed by the diverse shelters, tools and technologies that were developed according to uh, their environment, according to where they lived. Uh, they'd be doing actual, actual engineering without knowing it. Uh, yeah, that's really great. And um, I think for any uh, Indigenous students who are considering studying at the University of Saskatchewan, make sure to please get in touch with our Indigenous student initiatives because um, we have a really great community on campus. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope some students got to learn a little bit about mechanical engineering and sustainability. So okay. thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Next up is engineering in healthcare. This is Amira. She is a USASC engineer that is setting the goal of building the first wearable kidney. Amira and her team of engineers are working towards an artificial portable kidney that patients who have suffered from renal failure could wear. It would be the world's first wearable kidney. Now meet Brad, a USASC engineer who has made a transformational impact on breast cancer detection. Brad is an engineer and medical device executive whose research and work has led to a transformational impact on breast cancer detection using a solid state sensor solution. Now meet Carrie, a USASC engineer who is using wastewater to predict COVID numbers. Carrie and his team have developed an early warning system by sampling and testing Saskatoon's wastewater for the COVID-19 virus. Now let's meet some USASC engineers who are working in healthcare and hear their stories. Hello everyone, my name is Whitney Curtis. I graduated from the College of Engineering in 2019 with a bachelor's degree in engineering physics. I've always been really interested in the medical field and how I can apply my engineering background to try to make an impact in healthcare. I originally went into engineering not knowing much about it. In high school, I enjoyed calculus, physics, biology, and I loved to challenge myself, so I applied to the College of Engineering. Throughout my four years as an engineering student, I continued to learn more about what it meant to be an engineer. Right from the start of my degree, I became very actively involved in student groups that focused on biomedical technologies, such as Sask Invent and MedHack. This experience showed me just how diverse the field of engineering can be. As I worked on various biomedical technologies, I started to pinpoint my interests. I really enjoyed working with the clients, and trying to figure out the best way to help them with my skill set. For my capstone design project in my fourth year, I had the opportunity to work with a pediatric rheumatologist to design a diagnostic tool that he would use in his practice. Our client needed a method to measure range of motion in the hands and wrists of his patients with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Our solution had to improve upon the current method, meaning that it had to remove the subjectivity from taking the measurements and decrease the amount of time that it took to acquire these measurements. This was such an incredible opportunity to work on a multidisciplinary team to make a difference in the lives of patients, their families, and healthcare practitioners that would use our device. I'm currently a graduate student in medical physics, working on new techniques to deliver radiation therapy to patients who have received their lifetime radiation dose. 
During my graduate studies, I've had the opportunity to work at the Saskatoon Cancer Centre, collaborate with researchers from Health Sciences, the Western College of Veter Veterinary Medicine, as well as staff and scientists at the Canadian Life Source, just to name a few. My background in engineering physics has well prepared me to be a member of this research team. So I've been asked, has my path turned out like I expected it to? My answer to that question is absolutely not. I've shifted my career path a number of times, but that's the great thing about having an engineering degree. Engineering requires a lot of hard work and discipline, but I like to think of my degree like a tool belt. I was taught so many different techniques of problem solving, but most of all, I learned organization skills. I built a strong work ethic, and I gained confidence in tackling large problems. I know that even if in another 10 years, I want to change my career path again, that my background in engineering would be there to support me. When I take a look at where different members of my graduating class are, it's such a diverse group of people. Some are in graduate studies doing research in physics or engineering, some are working at technology companies, and some even have hopes of going into other professions. Even though we all have the same degree, there are so many different career paths that are available to us. So, how can engineers make an impact on healthcare? I firmly believe that diversity leads to innovative solutions, and this is something that I learned when I was working on multidisciplinary design teams. When members of your team are coming from different backgrounds, for example, different educational backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different genders, race, etc., it allows you to come up with unique, innovative, and effective solutions, as everyone on the team has a unique perspective to share. In healthcare, this is so important, as the problems faced in healthcare are sometimes incredibly complex and require a diverse, multidisciplinary team to solve them. I believe that the future of healthcare will involve engineers working as members of the healthcare team to complement the skills of other healthcare professionals. Thank you so much for listening to my story. I hope that this provided you some insight on where an engineering degree can take you and how an engineer can make an impact on healthcare. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Adam McKinnis. I'm a medical doctor by background but I don't make anybody call me doctor, so Adam's fine. I graduated medical school in 2015, and I started a Master's of Science in Biomedical Engineering in 2016. Uh, started my PhD in 2020, and I'm a Vanier Scholar at the University of Saskatchewan. Now, a little bit of the reason why I ended up going into biomedical engineering as a, a research discipline my ultimate goal right now is to become what's called a clinician scientist. So I would be spending part of my time doing clinical work, part of my time doing research work. So I started looking into it and started considering what would be the, the best path for me to get into uh, in terms of research if I wanted to be a practicing physician. And what came to mind was the story of the Vacanti mouse. And not a lot of people are familiar with that, but it was a proof of concept and it was a research paper that was published back in, I think about 1997. And what had happened is they'd done this experiment where they created a scaffold that looked like a human ear. It was about the size of like a three-year-old kid's ear. Uh, they seeded it with some cells and then grew it up and then implanted it under the back skin of a mouse. And so here's this hairless mouse with what looks like a human ear on its back. And of course, everyone's going, oh my God, this is amazing. People were freaking out. It was a really cool thing. And I was about 14 or so at the time when that happened. And I remember seeing that on TV. I was like, wow, that is so cool. So when I was in my undergrad and looking at the MD PhD program, <clears throat> that story came back to me. And I started to think about it and look into a little more. And I realized that regenerative medicine and more specifically what I'm working in tissue engineering is going to revolutionize the practice of medicine. So I decided that's probably the best area to get into in terms of research. So for example, in medicine, we use a lot of technology, a lot of diagnostic equipment, a lot of um, different, mater different materials, different things. And a lot of that, we rely very heavily on engineers to design, to build, so that we can use that. And engineers are on the cutting edge of building that technology, advancing that technology, and advancing what we can do as physicians. And on top of that, 
It's also the engineers and technicians that are responsible for maintaining that equipment. There's actually departments of clinical engineering within the, the health system, within the major hospitals to keep that equipment running for us. And another thing that I'm working on now as well is with the engineering capstone projects, um, I've actually been a client on the capstone projects. I think this is my third year as a client on capstone projects to do with global health projects. So when I was in medical school, I also completed a certificate in global health. And so I spent time in a Northern indigenous community, a place called Pine House. I spent six weeks on a practicum in Mozambique. And in some of these experiences, I, I saw some challenges that some of the communities were having, especially in Mozambique because of the limited resources that they had available in some of these communities. So for example, the hospital I was at where we were doing our training, one of the most advanced pieces of technology they had was an x-ray machine. And it was broke down part most of the time that we were there. They could do a little bit of basic blood work, but they didn't really have a lot of other equipment. So I worked with, um, I proposed an idea to a few people that I work with here in Saskatoon related to that certificate in global health program and started looking at how do we go about developing some of this technology and some of this equipment that they need, but in a way that's affordable. So we've looked at um, low tech and inexpensive medical devices such as uh, an ECG, an IV pump, um, a ventilator. And this year we're actually, I'm again, I'm a client on a capstone project. We're trying to finish up the, the ECG project from a few years ago. So I was just emailing the students the other day. Um, they're re getting ready to order their parts. They needed a little bit of advice on what kind of leads, electrodes, those kinds of things. And so I was helping to point them in the right direction. I'm hoping to connect them up with um, a few other engineers to help them with some of that. I connected them up with another friend of mine who's an electrical engineer who has some experience with ECGs. So it's been a really interesting opportunity and experience to do some of these cross collaborations and help students to recognize and understand the opportunities that are available to them in the future to um, if they want to work in those kinds of areas. What inspires me most about engineering, I think, is that creativity, that drive and that opportunity to do more and to create the future. You have the opportunity to help build the future. You, you through cross-disciplinary collaboration, which is something I highly recommend everybody try to do, find ways to bridge those silos to work together. Um, and so like I said, you get a chance then to help build the future and make the future what, make the future of the world and accomplish amazing things in doing that. Now, the, the other piece of personal advice is be aware of mental health. And I'm a mental health advocate because I deal with mental health myself. And so one of, these, one of the things that I strongly advocate for students is that if you're struggling, if you're having problems with your mental health, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Your faculty members, your supervisors, the university is very accommodating, very supportive in all of that. Like when I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder, the university was very cautious about when I returned to medical school to make sure that I was okay and in a good mental state to be able to do that. And you'll get the support, you'll get the help, and you'll be much more successful and much happier in doing it. And last but not least, let's meet some USASC engineers working in sustainable energy. Meet Angie, a USASC engineer whose passion for the environment has named her to Canada's 150 list. Angie works for the Saskatchewan Environmental Society and has trained over 900 building operators in Saskatchewan, helping them make their buildings efficient and comfortable. Meet Tom, a USASC engineer working on Saskatchewan's first geothermal facility. Tom and his team are engineering Canada's first geothermal or heat powered facility in Saskatchewan. This project will produce secure, stable, and sustainable energy. And finally, meet Samia, a USASC engineering student who started her career in research of sustainable energy. Samia completed a summer research internship at the SmartGen Lab, which investigates smart grids, electric power systems, and renewable energy. Now let's meet our last two panelists who are working in sustainable energy. 
Hi, I'm Sam Ansari. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Saskatchewan. Why did I become an engineer? Well, growing up, I always had a curiosity about how things worked. I used to break open any electronic item I would get my hands on to see how it worked from the inside. During high school, I also really enjoyed the physics laboratory experiments, particularly the ones involving electricity and magnets. Finally, I was also inspired by my eldest brother, who is an electrical engineer as well. Has your career turned out like you would have expected? For large parts, yes. I knew engineering would always be a rewarding career that will allow me to use my problem solving skills to develop solutions for real world problems. Although I did not expect that I would be making contributions to the society very early on in my engineering career. For example, through developing a medical device for a local hospital in Pakistan during my undergraduate years, or advancing the knowledge on sustainable energy during my graduate school. What do you do for your work? How is your work contributing to sustainable energy? Currently, I work as a senior graduate researcher in the Smart Grid and Energy Network Lab at the College of Engineering. As we know, sustainable energy sources, such as wind farms and solar panels, are uncertain and variable. They can increase the risk of electricity outages. So for this purpose, I perform research to develop new tools that electric utilities, for example, SAS power, can use to schedule and operate these renewable energy sources while maintaining uninterruptible electricity supply to our homes, schools, and businesses. What inspires me about engineering? Well, there are two things that inspire me about engineering. First, engineers solve challenging problems and make a difference to people's lives. As an engineer, you can design new sustainable energy sources to combat climate change, develop new medical devices to improve our health and well-being, or build intelligent robots to assist us in our everyday tasks. Second, engineers build the future. They are a driving force behind all innovations that will shape our future lives. They are building self-driving cars, virtual or augmented reality, and even spaceships for deep space exploration. What would you tell your past self about engineering? Engineering is also a very creative field. It is not all about understanding the physics or maths behind a machine or a process, but it also involves a lot of design and ingenuity. As an engineer, you have to be resourceful and creative to come up with the most efficient solution to a given problem. And I think this is something that I would tell my past self about engineering. What is something about being an engineer that would surprise people? I believe engineers make excellent entrepreneurs. They are trained to be creative problem solvers. They know how to develop a product or service with minimum resources. By the time they graduate, they already have a new product or service which they have developed as part of their senior design project. Engineers also have a curious mind and they perform well under pressure. These are some of the traits that successful entrepreneurs usually have. So in the end, I would say that if you want to solve real world challenges and build new stuff with a desire to learn, I cannot think of any profession better than engineering. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Andrew Talind. Uh, I graduated with a mechanical engineering degree from the U of S um, last spring. So that would be April of 2020. Crazy times, I'll remember it forever. <laughs> But my story of, of becoming an engineer uh, is a little bit of a, a strange one. But I think the first time where I really thought about engineering and what it was all about was, and I might be aging my mom a little bit with this one, but she had an old CRT TV that would, she would place on her fridge um, in the kitchen area. And she'd use that to watch the news every morning before I'd head off to school every morning without fail that thing would be on and it had you know the rabbit ear antennas on there black and white you know the works and the thing never worked like it never 
never did what it was supposed to do, always gave us body connection. And uh, I think I was in eighth grade at the time and we had to do science fair projects. And I don't know what made me choose this, but I thought I'm gonna figure out a way to make this TV work better or a way to, to figure out, you know, how can we make antennas better? So I did some tests, designed a little experiment and every day at different times and, you know, during different weather periods, I checked to see if, you know, how the antennas would perform and I would move them around and put them in boxes and things like that. Anyways, long story short, once the science fair competition came around, I ended up winning that, which was crazy. Didn't think much of my experiment at the time, but um, yeah, they sent most, a couple of the winners off to the Calgary Youth Science Fair, uh, taking place a couple months later. So I tweaked and tuned my experiment, you know, work on your trifold and make it all nice and whatnot. Ended up, ended up, and I ended up winning the um, Calgary Youth Science Fair as well. And I'll, I'll never forget this because this is the first time, um, you know, I kind of experienced engineering. But as I was going up to accept the award, like the, the trophy plaque they had, I walked up on the stage, you know, all proud of my accomplishments or whatever. Uh, and the guy who was giving the award, he, he shook my hand and he said, oh, congratulations, Andrew. You'll be a great engineer one day. And I looked down at the plaque and it, it said, you know, first place category engineering. And I think really that's the first time in my life where I like heard engineering and heard, you know, what it was all about or even kind of connected the two things. Anyways, that was the first kind of thing that was planted in my brain, you know, going into high school. Um, I was always interested in medicine. I really always wanted to be a doctor, specifically pediatric medicine. Uh, and I was at the U of C for, for an event that they had there about, you know, careers in health science. Um, and I was all, you know, I'm going into medicine, I'm going into medicine. And one of the panelists was, was talking about how they ended up getting into medical school. Uh, and she was a, she was a previous engineer. And I, you know, I talked to her after the event and she said, yeah, you know, you could do an engineering degree and still go into medical school after, if you want to do that and kind of bridge the two worlds together. And I thought, holy smokes that's amazing because <laughs> i you know throughout high school i loved i loved cars and i i bought my first motorcycle when i was 16 and i loved you know messing around in the garage and and kind of tweaking and tuning things i best i could i guess that the tinker would be a, a good term for it but you know i still really wanted to go into medicine and i didn't think those two worlds could ever intersect so at that point i thought no this is this is the right choice for me I'll go into engineering and if I still want to do the medicine thing later, let's absolutely do that. It's probably one of the best decisions uh, I've made in my life. I really had a great time there. Can't complain about anything. All the profs were incredible. All the opportunities I had were really great. And I think I made the right choice by, you know, sticking with that engineering approach and, and really giving it my best shot and, uh, and especially doing so at the U of S. So. Yeah, so I work for a company called Clear Rush Co. Um, and we're a, we're a small manufacturer based in uh, Sundry, Alberta. And typically we've done a lot of uh, emissions reduction, um, selling a lot of emissions reduction equipment to the oil and gas sector in specific. But uh, that industry has changed quite a bit in the last five years. And there's been a huge push for a lot of those clean technology products. You know, typically we've designed burner systems for tanks and heaters and kind of a lot of oil and gas refining, but we found that there's a huge push to do more with uh, a lot of the waste material that the oil and gas sector produces as a byproduct. Um, so we have a pretty, pretty substantial R&D department here. And once again, a lot of tinkering, a lot of fine tuning, and we're constantly on the whiteboard designing new new and different technologies that might help a lot of our clientele. But with the kind of growing vision of because we are a growing company, with kind of the direction that we want to go, we found that there's a huge opportunity for um, doing micro generation projects uh, for some of these oil and gas clients as well. So not only, you know, designing equipment that helps them, you know, produce more in a more environmentally sustainable way. But we found that there's an opportunity to integrate renewable resources into a micro-generation project that can 
you know, help add, you know, create electricity on a particular facility for the client, and then they can push that electricity back into the grid when they don't need it. So uh, a lot of, a lot of solar installations we've done, uh, particularly in Northern Alberta, and there's some, certainly some logistical challenges with installing solar in, in areas that might not get a whole lot of sun. Uh, you have to be really, you know, careful with your site configuration and where you put specific panels and how big your system is and what equipment you're using. And of course, safety is absolutely important. So a lot of a lot of electrical equipment that you spec out for these projects need to be rated to be used in hazardous environments. So there's a lot of a lot of logistics that go on. But big picture, I'm, I really like the idea of how can we help um, oil and gas producers, which have typically struggled to, you know, minimize their environmental footprint in daily operations and how we can help them do that better, more easily, more cost effectively, uh, and ultimately benefit the themselves and the environment a little bit by, you know, using what they already have in a new way. Yeah, so mechanical engineering, I mean, when I was going through classes and coursework, you learn all sorts of stuff about heat transfer and, you know, mechanical components and gears moving together and you know, how to effectively transfer energy from one point to the other. You do a little bit of work with um, some introductory electrical theory, but certainly not to the degree that an electrical engineer would do. But I think one of the, one of the major benefits or, you know, one of the special things about mechanical engineering is that in, in some ways you're a, a jack of all trades, master of none, but in a lot of ways, you get to see a wide variety of, of content. You get to experience a wide variety of engineering um, by studying mechanical engineering. So with specifically with my job, a lot of the stuff that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I haven't learned too, too much about. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about, you know, electrical components and, and system integration or anything about process design, but it's all seems to be integrated into one when you're working on these. Um, one of the big things that I enjoy is the fact that um, things move very quickly. I think that's also the nature of, you know, being in, in the manufacturing sector uh, and building things for other people. Sometimes clients and customers are on a tight timeline and they really want to get things done like right here, right now. But I've been finding that, you know, we could, I could go into a meeting on Monday morning and be presented a, a proposal, an idea, a project um, for, or a new product or something. And we could have, our team could have drawings ready by Wednesday afternoon and be on site on Friday afternoon, watching it get installed and flipping the switch and, and generating power, or, you know, folding out these big solar arrays and, and seeing them start up. Um, it's quite incredible how things move so quickly, but it's also really exciting to know that, you know, when you're scribbling down notes in your, in your notebook or, you know, working on the computer, creating drawings and layouts for a facility, uh, it's amazing to finally see that come to fruition and, and see that be um, commissioned and started up for sure. It's, it's super, it's super exciting. And I didn't think that, you know, it would happen so quickly, but things move very quickly and no days, no day is the same. Every day is different. Uh, and every day seems to be more and more exciting. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, so I guess my final question then is I understand that you're doing a project that's also combining healthcare and engineering. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that project and what you guys are working on. Absolutely. Yeah. So just maybe a little bit of context. Um, myself and a student, Mitchell Bigelow, we both graduated last spring. Uh, and for our capstone project, we were designing a lung biopsy tool, um, something that would snake down a patient's, uh, you know, trachea down there, go right into the lung and uh, sample a little bit of tissue for biopsy purposes. You know, diagnosing lung cancer or something called interstitial lung disease, you know, it would certainly be helpful for a wide variety of applications. So him and I, we had a little bit of background in that. Uh, and, you know, at the beginning of the whole COVID pandemic, we really wanted to, you know, keep working on that project. But 
the Saskatchewan Lung Association had, you know, frozen our funding from our project because they needed to build ventilators and fund other more important research at the time, which I certainly commend them for. That was the right move. <laughs> but it was too bad that we didn't get the time to work on that uh, after we had done with Capstone. Um, but a team had come along um, composed of two other university students, um, one of them, Brandon, from the, from the College of Medicine and uh, Nick from the College of Engineering. Uh, and they were working on a separate uh, hernia, hernia retractor tool for open ventral hernia repair surgeries. Uh, and they were looking for two other engineers to kind of do some of the grunt work. So Mitch and I joined right away. And long story short, we, we decided to create this company called Novita Medical Innovations. Uh, and right now we're working on that ventral hernia repair tool. Um, we've got it into the prototyping phase and you know we're, we're building little test units of it. Um, and we've been entering our company into some pitch competitions and we've seen a lot of great traction. We think that it's gonna be a really great product. Um, so we're just gonna keep developing that but my goodness, there seems to be no shortage of projects in the medical industry for sure. We have another one called the, the Nexagon, which is a protective neck brace for um, athletic concussion prevention. And there seems to be a lot of traction with that too. Um, you know, we don't wanna get our hopes up, but we've had people from the Calgary Flames say, yeah, once you guys have had this through the test lab and once you really refine this, yeah, we're gonna get this on our players. and and see this happening in action and see how it works. And I think the Calgary Stampeders also reached out to a member of our team and said, hey, yeah, once you guys have something ready, we'd love to test it during practices and, and see it in action. So a lot of great traction, but just another example of, of engineering and healthcare coming together to create some really cool products uh, and work on some cool innovation and, and tech, which isn't typically what happens. You know, a lot of people think of those two industries as being very distinctly different, but a lot of crazy and cool things can happen when they come together. So really exciting stuff and looking to work a little bit more on that in my free time for sure. Oh, that's so cool. Um, I think that's a really great example of, uh, you've only gradu been graduated for a year, but you're already working in sustainable energy and in healthcare and in all these different areas. So I think that just shows the diversity of an engineering degree and then it really can take you anywhere and you can really follow your passions and your dreams with that, even as a young alum. So thank Absolutely. you so, so much for your time today. Um, and yeah, I hope some students got inspired to, to listen to your story and thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. All right, so next up is we're gonna be playing a trivia game. So there is a little bit of a delay between me and my screen and what you're seeing on YouTube. So scan this QR code and then I will wait for everyone to get started in this game and then we will get started. So before we start the trivia, make sure to pop your questions in the comment section. In about 15 minutes, we're gonna turn it over to our panelists. And you're going to get to ask some questions for some current students, um, some USASC alumni. We have some researchers. So make sure to pop those questions in the comment section and we are going to be ready to answer them. All right, so I see we have quite a few people joining us. And if you don't have a phone, you can also use the link there. So USASC123 to, uh, to join the game. All right, so it looks like we have quite a few people. So I am going to get started. So the first question I wanna know is where are you guys tuning in from? So I am in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. I'm born and raised here. Um, but we do have a lot of international students um, at USASC. Oh, sweet, we have Australia, England. Uh, 
Utah. Great. So I am going to go to the next question. What city town are you from? So this is a picture of Saskatoon and unfortunately today it is I believe around minus 40. That's unusual. Uh, we have Humboldt, London, Calgary, Unity. Wow, it's great to see such a mix of people from a bunch of different places. We have Warman. All right, so for my next question, what word do you associate most with engineering? Discovery, I really like that one. Environment, math, chemistry, power. Yeah, and I hope today's event um, helped you see that engineering is more than just math and physics, because I think that's what a lot of people really think it is. And like all these words, it's problem solving, imagination, helping, tinkering. All right, so I'm going to go to the next question. Which of the following best describes you? I am curious to see who here, who's watching? Are you, have you applied? Are you a current student? Are you considering? Um, do we have any alumni, parents watching? That's great. So it looks like a lot of you are incoming students. So I am so excited uh, when we can welcome you to the college. Oh, we have an alumni joining us. That's fantastic. Wow, so it looks like we have a really great mix of different people joining us. That is really great to see. I'll just wait for till everyone answers. So that's great. So it looks like mostly applied in quite a few students that are considering USASC Engineering. So for the students that are considering USASC Engineering, make sure to pop some questions in the, in the comment bar so we can ask them during our Q&A if you have any questions for USASC Engineers. So next I'm kind of curious to find out what grade are you guys in? So it looks like we have a lot of grade 12s, um, several people that have a bachelor's degree, some grade 11 students, graduated students. So no grade 9 or 10 students, no PhD, no masters today. So a couple grade 11 students. Oh, there is one grade 9 student. That's great to see. All right. So for the next question, um so these are the different areas that we talked about today with our different panelists. I'm curious to see how interested are you in working in any of these areas, if any? All right, looks like quite a mix. One thing that I think is really interesting about all these areas is they're all growing areas where we're predicting to see a lot of jobs. Like for environment, they're predicting there to be a big increase in jobs in Canada. So it's a great area to get into. And same with sustainable energy. Saskatchewan is planning on getting more sustainable energy in the future, so it's gonna be a growing area. All right, so let's take a look. So oh, lots of you are interested in sustainable energy, pretty even mix of agriculture, environment, quite a few, and health, again, it's pretty mixed. So it looks like maybe sustainable energy is our winner. All right, so what major are you most interested in? And if you are a uh, current student, just put the major that you're in. I hope that you're interested in the major that you're in. 
All right, looks like there's a big mix. Mechanical engineering, of course, is always uh, the most popular. So for the uh, three students who put geological engineering, that one, according to APEGS, is actually the highest earners among engineering disciplines in Saskatchewan, if that uh, changes anyone's interest. Very interesting, so quite a mix. And in our Q&A um, coming up very shortly, we have a mixture of um, engineers from different disciplines. If you wanna ask questions about what is it like to be in mechanical engineering or some tips for potential um, mechanical engineering students, make sure to ask those too. So next we are going to play a trivia game it's with some questions about the college. So I'm just going to wait for everyone to join the game. All right, so we're just waiting for everyone to join. All right, just waiting for a few more people to get into the game. There, just gonna restart there, just make sure everyone is in the game. All right, that looks like now there are, everyone is in the game now. All right, great. Now we're gonna start the quiz. Sorry about that, everyone. So you already saw this question, so you better all get it right. And remember, there is more points the faster you answer the questions. So do we have virtual reality labs in first year? That is true. Uh, the first year lab that has virtual reality, you get to build bridges and test them out. So for the next question, what are the two certificates that you can do with a USASC engineering degree? It is, is it administration and global health, communication and entrepreneurship, sustainable energy and teaching, or STEM and horticulture? It is communication and entrepreneurship. Uh, and this is taught through the Ron and Jane School of Professional Development. And these are great additions to your degree if you're interested. So next question. Fact or fiction, a USASC engineering student group will be launching a satellite into space. And this is true. Um, and this will actually be Saskatchewan's first satellite launched into space, which is pretty sweet that it's a USASC engineering group. So if you want to be part of this, um, you'll actually get to, you can join if you want in your first year. And you can be part of something really amazing for Saskatchewan. So let's take a look and see who is winning. So it looks like Avery's in the lead followed by S.A., Sarah, Dominic, Lexi. Great job. So question four. What is not a key area of research at USASC Engineering? Health, agriculture, water, sustainable energy, environment, mining and minerals. Wow, a lot of you got it right. It is water. 
Water is part of um, the University of Saskatchewan's uh, research, but not a uh, particular pillar for USASC engineering. So there's only a few questions left, so we're on question five. True or false, does our first year program have finals? And let's see how you guys did. That is true. So for the six people who um, guessed wrong, um, instead of having uh, finals, we're going to have modular exams. So you'll be graded throughout your module. And then when the rest of campus is um, writing final exams, our students are going to be doing a design project instead. So what is this photo? of are they applying for admissions are they registering for classes or are they getting their final grades and thankfully all of these things you can do online now so you don't have to stand in a line these students are registering for classes so uh, you will get to register for your classes uh, at an event called U-Start that you can do all online and not have to stand in a long lineup like that. So good job to Sarah who is in the lead. So now question seven. How many living USASC engineering alumni are there? And you will get to meet some of them shortly. Is there 3,000, 8,000, or 12,000? So there are 12,000 USASC Engineering alumni. So what have USASC Engineering alumni done? So make sure to pick all that apply. So time's up. And actually, all of these are true. So we have um, USASC alum that are on SpaceX, work for Google, was an actor on Game of Thrones, helped solve crimes, climbing mountains. So this just shows the diversity of the different things that you can do with a USASC engineering degree. So good job to SA, who is in the lead. All right, just a couple questions left. What do you think this vintage photo is from? Time's up. It is actually the Engineering Student Society's tank truck. Just a couple questions left. This one is going to be about scholarships. So how much money does USASC Engineering give students every year? Is it two million, about half million, or just under 100,000? It is actually $2 million. So make sure to apply for scholarships because the deadline is coming up. Make sure to submit all of your documents by March 1st and apply for admissions by February 15th. So who do you think is donating a bunch of money to enhance USASC engineering? It is our alumni. They donate a ton of money. We have the best um, alumni network. We're very lucky to have them. So this is our final question to determine who the winner is. So what is the average wage of an engineering co-op student? $13 an hour, $20 an hour, or $26 an hour?
the average salary is $26 an hour. And that's the average salary. All right, and our winner is SA, followed by Sarah and Andrea. So good job, everyone. Thank you so much for playing. So next on our list is we are going to get to meet some USASC engineering um, alumni, faculty, researchers, and students. So these are the type of things that we're going to be asking questions about. So make sure to comment anything in the uh, comment bar and we are going to ask them. So I am just going to go get our panelists ready. So give me one second. All right, we are live. All right, we're live. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today for Engineering is More Than You Think. My name is Carlene Deutscher, and I am a member of the College of Engineering recruitment team. And I also, as a part of my job, get to work with many of our fabulous alumni. So today, I am quite proud to introduce to you, we've got a good diversity of engineers here with us. So we have Mike McGuire, and I'll Mike, maybe I'll just get you to wave and say a quick hello. Hello, everyone. And then we have uh, Professor Jafar Sultan, who is joining hello. us from the Department of Chemical or Chemical and Biological Engineering. I did forget uh, Mike. He is an electro or engineering physics double alum uh, from USASC. Next up, we have Whitney Curtis. Hi, everyone. Whitney is also representing the Department of Engineering Physics. And of course you met her in the interviews as well as Jafar. Next up we have our student in house is Jordan Richter. Hello everyone. And Jordan's gonna be a great person to ask about uh, the co-op experience and what that was like, cause he did that uh, with an interesting connection with SED systems and he is a computer science engineer and will be graduating next year. And the connection with SED systems, uh, we have Daryl Ketcher, who's joining us, who is an electrical engineering alum, as well as his, also his computer science degree from USASC. So I think that'll Hi, be a great connection. And Daryl also is the VP at SED systems. So Jordan, hopefully it's not um, too awkward having a past boss in the room and uh, virtually sitting beside him. And last but not least, we have Shanti Bergen. Hi. And Shanti is uh, joining us from the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and she is also a double alum, uh, getting her undergraduate and her master's in mechanical engineering. So let's just do maybe a quick roundhouse question that I'm going to pass. Um, you know what, Mike, I'm going to get you to answer this first, and then maybe we'll just rotate through everyone. And what do you love most about being an engineer? I know that's a question that was proposed to a lot of the panelists today, but I just, I want to do a quick pulse check on, you know, what is your reason? And we'll go through everyone else after that. For me, the, the big drawing factor and the thing that I liked the most in my career was starting with a blank sheet of paper and six months, a year later, walking out and having a built piece of hardware that's fully integrated, tested and operational. And so I've done that on U.S. Navy radars, I've done it on satellite ground stations, I've done it on different spacecraft missions. And it's just the joy of going, okay, I started this and now I've carried it all the way through and I've got this tangible product in my hand that I can say, I did that. Very cool. And I think Mike has a, a whole variety of experiences for anyone who is playing the trivia game. Here's a little hint. Uh, Mike may or may not have been that SpaceX engineer. So, uh, you know, has worked along the now famous, I guess, Elon Musk. So Jafar, what is your favorite part about being an engineer? Um, maybe I can think of problem solving. Really, we receive training, training so that we can respond to the needs of the community and society. It doesn't matter environmental issues, something related to transportation. That problem solving ability is the most favorite for me. I think that's you hit the nail on the head where a lot of engineers will say it's definitely that problem solving. Um, we'll go Whitney and then maybe right after Whitney, we'll get Jordan to lead off in that question. 
Sure. So I think that my favorite thing about engineering is that there's so many different places that an engineering degree can take you. And, you know, there's, there's never going to be a dull moment in your career. Uh, I think that something that I like is that I'm always being challenged um, and I can really do uh, such a number of different things with my engineering degree as my base. So I think my favorite thing with engineering is the uniqueness of the solutions that we come up with and that you're taking this as wealth of, of knowledge and information and creating something that uh, other people may not have thought of or not created before that you get to do it for the first time and the pride in, in creating something new that is well thought out and well designed to be able to solve a problem. Good answer, Jordan. And I think that's what I love most. I'm not an engineer by trade, but I love working with engineers because it's that question of why and why not. Um, Daryl, what's your favorite part of being an engineer? Oh boy, where to begin? Um, it's the, I really enjoy the problem solving aspect of it. I, I really enjoy building stuff. When I was a, a little kid, I'd take everything apart and, and now that I'm an engineer, I can put it back together again. So that's, that's kind of sweet. Uh, it's given me the opportunity to learn something new every day. I've had the opportunity to travel all over the world. It's given me great opportunities. It challenges me every day. Uh, I can't think of a, a career that I'd rather be in. Thank you. And Shanti, we'll go with you next. I know you kind of have an interesting path into engineering that originally you thought maybe vet med was in your, in your vision, but you were more interested in the harnesses that helped to hold and I guess, lift up the livestock and horses and that's what brought you into engineering. And so what's your favorite part about being an engineer? Oh, Carlene, you know too much about me. I can't, can't keep doing these things. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I love engineering, mainly for working for that aha moment. When you go up to your project manager or a business grad uh, like yourself and you go, okay, this is how it works. And they go, Oh my word, that's so cool. Um, that's probably the coolest part about engineering for me. And like a lot of the other people here said, we got to do that every single day. We got to look for those challenges and actually solve them. And that's, that's something I will never stop doing. I love it. And we have someone who just popped into our call and I'm very pleased to introduce everyone uh, to hopefully it'll be uh, your Dean as you become a student with us next year is Dr. Suzanne Presta. So Suzanne, we're just posing the question uh, to everyone is what do you love most about being an engineer? There we go. I have my voice. I went into engineering because I fell in love with the idea of working in teams and gathering people around me with different skill sets and just coordinating a group so that they're mobilized to solve big problems. Um, that is what really excites me. So it's good that I'm the Dean because that's what I do all the time. <laughs> And I get to see now people like Shanti coming in and saying, hey, I have this great idea. I think we should do it this way. Or look at somebody else and say, you know, I, th I don't think we have the math right on this yet. I think that we, oh, there's the problem. And so as you get to be more into the leadership side, you do a lot more troubleshooting, a lot more mentoring, a lot of teaching and guiding and coordinating uh, resources, projects, people to really achieve big things. And so I agree with what Daryl said. I have been incredibly happy. The profession has treated me really, really well. I have a lot of wonderful friends around the world, locally, across the country. And I just really appreciate the team spirit and the profession. I think that's like I've mentioned before that I am not an engineering grad, but the profession as a whole, I don't think you can find a more welcoming group of people than engineers. And I just really, really love the diversity of what the college has brought in, not only for students, but alumni as well. So Suzanne, we had a question earlier come in to us and I think um, you bring such a diversity within your career as a chemical engineer working in a variety of industrial plants and I think that's something that's on everyone's mind right now during the pandemic and what potentially what we're all eagerly waiting for is that back rollout. And 
I think what might be surprising, you know, we explored a lot of the roles that engineers have with health, but chemical engineers play a huge role in the vaccine mm -hmm. rollout. So can you kind of just speak a little bit more to, you know, what is an engineer's role with this, the, with the vaccine and the whole rollout process? I would love to. Uh, one of my co-editors on the first edition of the Handbook of Industrial Mixing actually worked at Merck. And he spent his whole career scaling up new drugs, pushing them through development and getting them into production. So he was the lead engineer on the first um, AIDS drug that was effective. And one of the stories he used to tell is, you know, they were getting the wrong crystal form. They had done this at the bench scale. They had done this in the 20 liter batch scale. And then they went to the 200 liter batch scale and when you do multi-phase flow and crystallization, the scale up is very tricky. And so they were working on this 200 liter batch. And he says it was so frustrating because the batch would be beautiful and clear and we'd turn our backs and suddenly it was milk, like all these tiny useless crystals that they couldn't do anything with. Because you have to, in that case, get the right form of crystal, not just make it solid. So this one, I think, is a lot more straightforward. But what people are doing is they're trying to, if you think about it, when you make uh, one batch of cookies in a mixer, it turns out one way. But if you try to scale it up too far, you run into all sorts of problems and you're up to your armpits in nasty dough. If you want to make one pizza, it's easy. If you want to make 200, well, that's a totally different way to solve the problem because if you watch the ovens, they rotate through as a conveyor belt, right? So I know people that are on the teams that are scaling things up, and I can tell you they've got engineers working with their technical teams 24-7, the best people in the world. And they know how to do this. This is what they do for a living. So this is going to happen. We can't change the physics by yelling at people. This is another thing I love about engineers. Like, just calm down. It's not going to change. We just have to figure out where the problem is and keep moving. Because we'll figure it out. We just have to persist. And so I totally think that their timelines are reasonable, that we're going to get through this production line scale up, you know, they have to change the pipes and the valves and the vessels. You got to build it. it takes time. We're going to get there. So I just think it's so exciting that we're seeing this roll out incredibly quickly at a scale we've never attempted before with a new technology that's super solid, that people went out on a limb to develop, and we're doing things in a very, very different way that I think is really innovative and doesn't sacrifice anything in terms of safety, quality, rigor. I think we're really in a good place. So I'm very excited to see this rolling out. And just keep breathing. Give us three to six weeks, we'll all be good. And I think that's just the true engineering mentality, right? Just tackle things bit by bit by bit and eventually that makes the whole larger picture so thank you Suzanne for that and you know I think that'll give us a little bit of hope to know engineers are behind this and you know public safety is the number one priority too and that's why an engineer is on the job. Shanti we had a question come in uh, right in actually the beginning of this and a student was curious of how do mechanical engineers help? And I'm just going to leave that broad and wide open for you to answer. All right, sounds good. Um, yeah, I've been asked that many times because a lot of people think mechanical engineers, you build the trains, you build the cars, and that's it. Um, but I'm actually working for a Graham construction right now on a hospital. And I'm in charge of making sure that hospital runs as efficient as, as, efficient as possible. And right now we're working towards getting it to be 60% less energy use in that hospital versus any other hospital in Canada. And that's a huge feat, but by doing that, we're gonna be saving emissions on everything. Uh, we're actually using a co-regeneration system, which is just a huge decrease in energy, but it's a new system. Uh, so mechanical engineers work on a lot of new systems, so do many other engineers here. Uh, 
but yeah, that's probably the biggest way that we help is we start firing those test pilot projects on huge hospitals, um, hotels, things like that. And they can make a huge increase to the global um, structure. As far as how they help on a different scale, if, whether or not it was just more of a health thing, um, that can go down to just a little house uh, with geothermal, different things like that, as well as making everything else just more efficient. I think that's one of the main words that I've used in my thesis and as well going forward is just making things more and more efficient. That's, that's what I've been focusing on for sure. Well, and I think I'd like everyone just to maybe hold up uh, to the camera your iron ring. It's Shanti doesn't have hers on today. She's probably been out working. Jordan will have to patiently wait for his. So Jordan, you'll get there. But I think that's also another thing and not only mechanical engineers, it's every engineer in Canada. How do they help? It's, it's that oath of the iron ring and keeping our whole society safe. And I think that's just a, a very, very cool and unique um, aspect to begin an, an engineer. And Susanna, I know you had quickly sent me a little chat message saying that you could answer that too, if you wanted to quickly answer that. And then I actually have a question for Whitney after this. I just wanted to riff off of what Shanti's been saying and the fact that we've been talking a little bit about healthcare. Um, I've talked about my oldest daughter before. She, she builds airplanes, and, but she has decided to take the next 18 months and work with Doctors Without Borders. And so she's getting ready to go down to the DRC, the Congo, and work as a medical supply chain person. And so supply chain is part of what mechanical engineers are good at. The interesting part of the story is this, the Congo is actually much bigger than France. It has 110 million people, but the corruption there lasted for so long that all of the roads you see on Google Maps have fallen into disrepair. And so the only way to move things around is by water. So, it turns out that the engineers that have worked with MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, come back and they say, the single most important thing for delivering healthcare is roads. Without roads, we can't get people to the hospital, we can't transfer them to the next bigger hospital, and we can't get the supplies we need to do our jobs. So of course you need doctors, but even after you get the medical team there, the roads are a critical infrastructure for delivering so many things. And so when you think about this, it really changes your perspective on building highways is not just about moving cars around, it's actually about making everything work. And so I just thought that was a really awesome story to pair with another one that my GP shared with me. He says, you know, what is the biggest thing that has saved lives in the last 200 years? I said, oh, vaccines, easy. He says, no. I said, you know what? Clean drinking water, right? Something as simple as clean water. So these little things make a huge difference in um, how people grow up and raise their families. So it's a really, really cool thing to understand about what we do. Well, and I think there's so many interconnections there too, Suzanne, too. Like, you know, you, we have our civil engineers, we have our environmentals, you know, there's electrical engineers, there's computer engineers. It's that interweaving that is really just so spectacular. And, Whitney, this is one question that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out to you. And the question is, um, what typical types of engineers do you see in healthcare? And this is good, maybe a little bit of a trick question, but I think with you um, studying in medical physics, I think you'll be the best person to answer this. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I, I agree with Carleen that that's a bit of a trick question because I, I think that that's one of the greatest things about an engineering degree is that, you know, everyone can bring a unique perspective to make an impact on not only just healthcare, but uh, a bunch of different fields all across the spectrum. Um, but I can speak to my own experience that uh, as an engineering physics alumni, 
Uh, I'm currently working in medical physics at the Saskatoon Cancer Center. So this is a way that um, I'm using my engineering degree to make an impact on healthcare. But I, I think like everyone has said here tonight is that uh, you can really be any kind of engineer and make such an impact on healthcare and bring your unique perspective to solve these incredibly complex problems that are faced in the healthcare system. So yeah, definitely a bit of a trick question because I think you can make an impact no matter what your background is. Totally. Is there anyone else, um, just because we have such a diversity of engineers in our panel today that wanted to add in anything on that health topic before we move on to our next question? If not, we'll just jump into the next question. So with that, we did have a question. I'm just gonna scroll up here. Um, so someone was just wondering that um, compared to some other uh, more of the technical or technician degrees that are out there and options, how much hands-on learning is there within the College of Engineering here at USASC or is it all textbook and lecture based? So Jafar, I'm gonna pass it off to you because you're at the head of the classroom, you're teaching students every day as well as leading a dynamic research team. And then maybe I'll flip it over to the other side of the classroom after and we'll get uh, Jordan to share his experience on the student side. Sure, really our education system uses both theoretical learning and also hands-on learnings. Basically we have like in our department, for example, we have a unit operations lab that is like small scale, know uh, units of real industrial operations so the students go there and and change i know temperature pressure on a distillation column the same way that you will do in a refinery for example and they take samples they can check the performance of the column with what theoretically they would predict so really there is a very good combination of both theory and hands-on. And my personal experience is that students really learn by doing things. So they enjoy those labs and really what they have learned, that becomes kind of precipitated in, in their mind. So we have a very good, I would say, uh, combination of, of both. I think that's, it's so true that, you you know, even if, once we are in the halls, you can see that hands-on interaction between students in the lab spaces that they're working on, or even if they're doing a capstone design project, they're out in the field. That's how I got to know Shanti is, you know, in the Hardy lab, we spent a lot of time there and just doing hands-on different activities and leaning on the teams that are there. I mean, Jordan, your experience might be a little bit um, unique in the fact that you, you're, you know, your computer science people might automatically assume that you're behind a computer all day. So maybe just speak a little bit more to kind of your hands-on experience. Yeah, so computer engineering is a little bit different as in hands-on is on a computer. So with remote learning, we're still hands-on like we'd be anyhow, uh, getting to connect into things like spectrum analyzers and uh, uh, different computer equipment that's even sitting on the universe and get to connect to it from our homes. Uh, we still are working hands-on with equipment that we might be using in industry after, or even like with capstone, I have a little bit of circuit I'm working with here for testing that we get to work with that hands-on. It's, it's not uh, theoretical at that point, you're putting into practice. It, it, it's something that actually exists there in front of you. I think what needs to be mentioned as well is like, there's some amazing student clubs at the U of S the, you know, for example, the U of S space team and the hands-on um, experience and knowledge that they gain from, you know, their current work right now, attempting to, to build a CubeSat and put it on orbit. Like that's a hell of a thing to have on a resume. So, uh, you know, that and, and, and all the other student clubs on campus give such an incredible opportunity for that kind of hands-on learning. and, and you, you learn stuff there that you're not going to learn in the class. You're not going to learn it out of a, a textbook. You know, it's all that hands-on stuff that comes with experience. And that's certainly a leg up for students when they're, you know, first applying for jobs in the industry. And uh, it looks great on a resume. Well, I think Daryl and Jordan, it's, I'm glad, Daryl, that you jumped in because I was actually going to connect you and Jordan a little bit of that, even that hands-on experience through the co-op. And I know you work with tons of co-op students and just 
that whole experience too. That's a whole nother way of that online or on, sorry, hands-on learning that people can really get. But is there anyone else that would like to add on to that hands-on um, first textbook learning or should we hop into the next question? I see Suzanne unmuted herself, so she might jump in. I'll just say that you don't have to be in a formal lab to play with hands-on learning about chemical engineering or any other kind of engineering. Um, once you start to see it, you will see it everywhere. And so the poking and prodding and exploring and understanding um, goes on pretty much forever. And I won't get into a lot of detail, but I will say that my kids, by the time they were four, were going up to puddles and saying, is this turbulence, mom? <laughs> And so it becomes a bit of a game and it really, you don't have to be limited to the lab. It's everywhere. Well, I think that's just one thing, once again, not being an engineer or getting to work with engineers, you know, you can ask them the simplest thing. We're on a farm. There's, I feel like my husband and I are always talking, this could be a capstone project. Oh yeah, we got to talk to some engineering students. They can help us with this. Um, so we did have some questions just coming in here about uh, co-op students and it, um, Jordan, I'm going to get you just to maybe talk about your co-op experience from the student side, but then after Jordan kind of speaks that, Daryl, I'm going to get you just to kind of talk about, you know, what is it like working with young engineers as they come in and kind of your role in an alumni role, but then also in the employer side. So I did my internship with SD Systems, which is now Callian Advanced Technologies uh, here in Saskatoon. It was a really interesting and fantastic experience. It gave me, uh, starting out, an idea of testing software, testing large-scale systems, and just the variety of things going on in engineering gave me actual hands-on experience working with uh, large sets of digital infrastructure and uh, getting to work with something that you might not get to experience in a university setting because university doesn't have racks and racks of servers that they're running systems on that you get to test. So it lets you go beyond just the, the small scale to a very large scale uh, understanding of knowledge and then getting that work experience and a connection in someone that you might continue to work for after you're done school as well, or in my case, still be employed by well and finishing up my last year. Right. So from our side of things, uh, we've had great experience with interns. And one of the things that we really shoot for at, at Callian is to get those interns in and doing real work. So I think Jordan will attest to the fact that he got the opportunity to do some pretty neat stuff. Um, we uh, you know, Jordan, Jordan didn't mention it, but the work he was doing he was part of a team of like over 30 people uh, responsible for putting uh, satellite radio into the vehicles of millions of people every single day. And those are systems that cannot fail. So uh, Jordan was a part of that. Uh, he, he had a great experience, I hope you'd say, at, at Callan, and we are working real hard to get him back uh, for full time. So whether he knows that or not, that's the plan. Uh, so uh, the, it's very important for us to get those, um, th those bright young grads in or, or interns in, give them real life experience, real work experience, working side by side with, you know, uh, more senior members of the team, and really in a way, it's an extended sort of uh, uh, job interview and stuff where we get to see what they can do and, and they get to see what we're all about. And it's it's win win. Um, we hired uh, seven interns last year round. This year we've got eight. And, and so we're really excited to bring them on board come May. Thanks, Joel. I think that's what's really neat too, just hearing about, about your Jordan's experience, but then yours is also seeing, we call it our thorough family and it's our engineering uh, motto here at USASC. And I think it's just that, that connection between students and alumni is that it's a little bit of a big brother, big sister kind of mentality is that there's so many alum that are willing 
to help young engineers find their place in the workplace, answer any questions that it's really just this really unique mentorship. And I think, you know, Daryl, you've come to lots of our events and you're always great in interacting with students. Mike, you're in there and coaching on the USST team and bringing in that experience and even goes beyond that into our faculty and staff supporting our students. So um, we do have a question that came in and they had actually asked um, a day in the life of an environmental student um, or sorry, an environmental engineer. But I'm actually gonna flip that around a little bit and I'm just gonna keep it a little bit more broad is what is the day in a life of an engineer look like? So Shanti, why don't you answer that one for us? For sure. So right now I'm working from home because we're finalizing the project. So it's all computer reporting. Uh, we still have to do that. Same as the end of every lab. Um, but when I was out on site, it was 7 a.m. was when work started, but 6.45 was when you were there for toolbox safety meetings. So run that through with all the guys, make sure everyone knew what was going on that day and everyone had a job to do. So literally I was in charge of making sure that everyone knew where they were going, knew what they were up to. Uh, when they had questions, they came to me. Um, and then for the rest of the day, I was walking around site doing quality control and most importantly, safety, making sure everyone was working safe. Everyone had the PPE, the equipment that they needed on site um, in charge of scheduling, making sure everything was running well. My list is getting really, really long. Um, but for the most part, when you are an engineer, you're expected to know the answers. And probably the biggest thing I learned very quickly is that it's, it's a lot better to say, I don't know, but I'll find out than just guess and check later. Um, that takes one oopsie and you realize it's a bad idea. Learn that in school, don't, don't do that out in the field. Um, but yeah, it's busy. I didn't sit in my desk for very long when I was out on site, it was up and go. And then by five, 5.30, that's when I wrapped up everything and planned for the next day. So you are the organizer, you are supposed to have all the answers. And it's not only just, okay, this is what the drawing said, this is what we have to build. It's, does that actually make sense? Does that actually seem like the right way to go about that? You're constantly guessing and double checking what everyone actually said would do in the field. So it's a big responsibility that you have every day, but as long as you got confidence in what you've learned and confidence in who you're working with, and then ultimately confidence in yourself, uh, you'll do great at it. And I know that's a great answer, Shantae. I know Suzanne wanted to add in uh, the day in the life. I think Shanti's done an absolutely fabulous job of explaining what it looks like on the on the ground and in operations. It's a chemical plant, a construction site, a manufacturing facility, keeping people safe, keeping people focused, keeping them organized, looking after the things that they need, making sure that you have the answers and you get them in the right way just a great description of what it looks like on the ground. And also, I think there are many jobs that are a little bit more uh, the stereotype, the sitting at your desk, doing a lot of calculations, doing the reservoir modeling, um, keeping those models moving. And I have friends that have done simulations that move around the world 24 seven, where it's passed from a team in Amsterdam to a team in Texas to a team in India and back again. And so they do the handoff. It's not like you're working crazy hours. You're doing the handoff as it goes from one time zone to the next. So there's so many different ways to get yourself to a place where the working style you have is a good match to the lifestyle you want to have. And maybe not the first year, but very quickly, you get to make those choices and get yourself to a place that really works for you. I think that's just the whole diversity of engineering is that you can really find a career path that really, I would say, lights your soul on fire if you want to be a little bit corny and just and sparks that passion. Before we move on to our last and final question, does anyone want to add in to the life as an engineer and the, what, what does that day to day look like? I don't see any mics being unmuted. So I'm gonna, Whitney, I'm gonna get you to lead this off and we're just gonna do a round table. And I think it's been just so great to see so many students tuning in and just being really excited about engineering. Um, and the one question that I'm gonna ask is, what is that one unique, maybe it's a standout or a very exciting moment um, that you've done as an engineer that stands out and just is kind of like, a, wow, this is super cool. I can't believe I just got to do that moment. 
That's a fantastic question. And I, I'm, I'm trying to just pick one because I, throughout my last six years since I started engineering, I have had so many unique opportunities to do so many different things, whether that was uh, working on my capstone design team and building a diagnostic device for a pediatric rheumatologist to use uh, that I mentioned earlier in my interview, uh, or working in student groups, uh, building prosthetic limbs. Uh, that is something that I had the opportunity to do during my uh, undergraduate degree. But I think that probably the most exciting thing uh, that I got to do was I had the opportunity to go to Norway and participate in a counter rock program, it's called. And I, as a fourth year uh, engineering physics student, I had the opportunity to build and launch a rocket in Norway. Uh, so that was probably the coolest thing that I got to do during my degree. I've seen pictures from the trip and it just looked like phenomenal, like super, super cool thing to do. Jordan, I know you, you know, you're not quite a professional engineer yet, but I know you have no shortage of experiences and cool things that you've done. So as a current uh, comp eng student, what's kind of the one standout moment for you? Uh, I think I'm going to pull something from internship here is within the first couple months of internship, uh, I was given the chance to essentially write the testing, plan the testing, do the testing for a project uh, at Canlan Advanced Technologies. It was given to me. It wasn't uh, something like I got to go run the test and was told what to do. I got to design them from the ground up. And so it was the ability to, as a student, do something really real and, and very comprehensive and uh, something I never thought I would have been able to do as an intern. Very cool. I love hearing those stories where students just get to tackle something right away in their co-op. Uh, Daryl, what's one of the, you know, those, that standout moment for you? So I thought rather than just talk about myself personally, that I'd speak more from the uh, perspective of, of the team and the company. So one of the things that, that we have done that uh, some, some people on, on here may or may not know of is back uh, a few years ago, uh, the Rosetta mission that was launched to send a probe to land on a comet. Uh, the, the satellite and the probe out to that comet and, and that attempted landing, a, a lot was made of the spacecraft, of, of course, but uh, it was a system that we designed and developed out of here in Saskatoon that was on the other end of that link. So we worked on the systems that transmitted signals to the satellite that would uh, control the spacecraft, uh, send it uh, commands and receive telemetry back. And uh, these antennas are like 35 meters across, you know, that's a deep, decent field goal in the CFL. There are these enormous structures and the amount of testing and verification and design work that went into that was phenomenal. Um, and the thing is, you only get like one chance, one chance to do that right. And, and you can't really test it out ahead of time. So uh, when it worked and uh, when that, that probe made it, uh, when that landing was attempted, it was, it was a phenomenal feeling of accomplishment for, for the entire team and the entire company. And uh, yeah, just, uh, just was a great feeling. That's super cool. I had no idea that you guys did that and that's, you know, right in our backyard in the university. So that's quite phenomenal. I'm just waiting. Um, Mike, can you see the share screen option yet? Has that popped up? So Mike has a little bit of a picture to share with all of us, which I think is pretty cool. Can you see it? We can see it. Okay, that's one of the big American nuclear aircraft carriers. If you look above the conning tower, there's a square flat plate. That is an SPS-48F radar. It's an air surveillance radar that provides situational awareness uh, to about a 200 mile nautical mile radius around the aircraft carrier. Uh, I started work with ITT Gilfillan and they were having no ends of problems with it in doing a systems upgrade. And they found that the computer code to run the antenna and the radar was taking 28 minutes to download a simple status report to say that yes, the radar is healthy, no, the radar is not. 
and 28 minutes obviously isn't something that a U.S. Navy captain would put up with for very long. I came in as an engineering physics grad with a specialty in radio systems. That's why they hired me is my knowledge of radio, but they needed something to be done for the uh, radar performance evaluation. And I sat down and used my experience from both the university and the uh, job that I did working on a couple of different spacecraft. And I was able to draft up a software plan architecture that uh, once they implemented it was getting a status report out of it in eight seconds. So 28 minutes down to eight seconds, everybody was happy and my boss would haul me into a room and hand me a check every now and then to tell me, we really want you to stay. So uh, knowing now that my architecture goes out with every US Navy carrier battle group just gives me a real sense of pride that I'm helping out in a way that uh, can make the world a safer place. So that's my sob story. Uh, for the students tuning in that have any older siblings in the college, Mike usually does our hard hat ceremony welcome and regularly interacts with our students. And that's the first time I've heard that story. And I can um, assure you that he's got no shortage of amazing feats like that. That really, once again, just goes to engineers keeping people safe. Now, Jafar, I'm going to pass it off to you and kind of to share your unique story that you've um, had the privilege and opportunity to do as a chemical engineer. Yeah, well, right now what I'm doing as faculty, I'm really, really leading research. Uh, so really each one of these research areas are exciting. Right now what we have uh, in the lab is uh, an air cleaning system uh, to help us with this COVID situation. So the whole idea is that the, the reactions, the catalysts that we have been doing for 10, 15 years, now we are changing it to something that can sanitize air. So you can install it in a, in a building, in a hospital, on a bus, so that you can get rid of the bugs in the air. So that is something that keeps me kind of happy every day because I listen to the progress reports from my students and we have you know, weekly discussions how far we are with this project. So it's all fun and, and exciting. And I just and I think not to take any credit away from that project, but you're also fueling the minds of so many young students day in and day out. I know lots of students say that you know, you were a great professor to have and they learned so much. And I think it's just pretty remarkable what our faculty are doing. And definitely when you come into school at USASC Engineering, take the time to know your profs and learn what they're doing in the research labs. Cause it's, it's really just groundbreaking to hear, you know, what is happening here at USASC. So just, just take that time. Um, Shanti, I'm gonna pass it off to you. And you, I know have also a really uh, diverse different career path. Um, so what's your story that you'd like to share? Um, probably my main one would be for my thesis. I worked with nutrient potash mines uh, to see if they could start using fire resistant hydraulic fluid in their underground mining systems. So they use huge miners uh, to mine the potash. And that mining system runs on very flammable fluids. So if fire breaks out, everyone down there is in safe bunkers for as long as it takes to clear the smoke. So they wanted to see if these fire resistant fluids could be used. So I, I had the opportunity in the university, um, in the lab to be able to design a hydraulic test stand that replicated those miners hydraulic systems and filled it with instrumentation. So um, to all the people who are thinking mechanical engineering is just about nuts and bolts, that's a huge portion of it. You'll learn shear stress, you'll learn tension, it'll just keep going in that way. But we learn a lot about instrumentation. So make friends with electrical and computer engineers because uh, we need them to actually prove uh, that our systems work and do well. And I was so grateful I did. It was a huge team effort, that's for sure. Um, but that was pretty cool to be able to be running those hydraulic systems. Uh, that other same one of those miners be able to test that fluid to hopefully be able to switch the fluid in those miners to safe fluid. So those miners stay safe uh, when they're a mile below our feet. And I think that's just, I love seeing Jordan and Daryl's big smiles light up when you said that cross collaboration and having to work with other engineers. And I think that's just so cool, right? Is that you can tap on another discipline, a friend in that area and say, hey, I need your help and need your insight. And they'll come to you and say, hey, I need your help and insight. 
Uh, Mike, before we go back and let Suzanne kind of have the last mic stand as the engineer, I did see that you went and grabbed a book. So I don't know if there was something else that you would like to share. This is the radar system software design document. I just, you know, it's 36 pages. What was it? Just, just, just that, you know, just 36 pages of keeping people safe while at sea. So very cool. Suzanne, I'm going to give you the last op or the last remarks. Just blew it off overnight. Hey, Mike. <laughs> I got to say, I love this question because it reminds me of one of my students. When we first published the Handbook of Industrial Mixing, I brought it to class to show it off to my mixing students. And one of the guys looked up and he gave me this little grin and he says, hey, Dr. Krista, is that the coolest thing you've ever done? And I said, that is the best question ever. And yes, it is. And I went up to my boss's office afterwards and I said, I know what my life goal is. And he says, what? <laughs> and I said, I want to keep doing the coolest thing I've ever done. And the question was asked in 2004. And I got to say every year, there's a new coolest thing I've ever done. And so it's really hard to pick the coolest over 30 years. Um, we had the opportunity to support a local company um, by collaborating with them on development of a ventilator over the first phase of the pandemic. And for people that haven't been involved in medical equipment, it's hard to appreciate how tight the regulatory systems are and how much validation there has to be. RMD engineering managed to get their ventilator through all the regulatory and into hospitals starting March 20th. They had it in hospitals December the 4th, January the 4th. It was approved December 4th. We had six co-op students out there. We had a bunch of our technical staff out there working with the team. We actually lent them a lathe from our machine shop while we were firmly shut down, which caused a bit of a stir in the machine shop, but we got through that. And the technology behind this is so cool. I can't tell you about it, but I can tell you, what I can tell you is they took a completely different approach to the design and the fluid mechanics behind it and the turbulence design is so cool. The materials engineering, the insight about how things work, just so impressive to see these things happening in Saskatoon. So, you know, you'll keep doing the coolest thing you ever did. I encourage you to adopt that as a life goal. It's really a lot of fun. And I think that everybody at this table has a lot of fun doing the work that we do. So I wanna thank Carlene and the team who've been working really hard to pull this event together for the last few weeks. And I know that they put their heart and soul into making sure that you get the best material you possibly can. I also want to thank all the alums and the members of the college who took some time out at the end of really busy days to join us to have a conversation. It's been wonderful for me to see everybody. Um, we're, we're pretty busy keeping the operation moving these days, so we don't have a lot of social events. So this has been a real treat for me, and I hope it's been really valuable for all the people tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you in the fall. Yes, thank you again, everyone. And I really, I hope, I think with the presentations and of course hearing from each one of our alumni and student panelists today is that engineering, it's really more than what you think. There is, there is no limits to what you can do with an engineering degree. And maybe just throw a quick comment down in the chat, just thanking our alumni and our students for taking the time, like Suzanne said, out of their busy days, um, just to be here and kind of share Honestly, I think it's just a really small nugget of the amazing and really cool things that they do. So with that, our team is going to sign off and thank you once again for exploring uh, all the possibilities that you have as a USASC engineer. And if you haven't gotten your application in yet, make sure to do that at admissions.usask.ca. And if anyone has any questions, uh, you can contact our recruitment officer, Caitlin, at en or engineer.recruit at usask.ca. Until the next time, goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.